Um, tomorrow in class for our double period, we will be working on the second part of our unknown identification. So you'll be working on your anion identification tomorrow in class, and then we'll also be working on some more practice stuff and kind of going over some of the concepts in Chapter 19. Um, in case you have not done so already, your 19 outline is due today. You all knew that was coming, so please make sure that does get submitted. Chapter 19 primarily deals with the three laws of thermodynamics and introduces two major concepts that we have not Um, chapter 19 primarily deals with the three laws of thermodynamics, and there are two major concepts that we've never talked about before that are introduced. The first is going to be entropy, and we're going to talk in detail about what entropy is. And the second is going to be Gibbs free energy, which is a way of incorporating both enthalpy, which is something we talked about in chapter 5, and entropy to determine what's going on in a system as far as energy is concerned. So we can talk about whether or not energy is being released from a system or being absorbed by a system by remembering to talk about things like systems, surroundings, and, and the like. Okay. So just some recall from Chapter 5. One of the major ones is the law of conservation of energy, which says you cannot create or destroy energy from nothing. It's just not a thing. Okay. Another one is going to be that the total energy of the universe that exists is constant. That's everything, every star, every galaxy, everything, okay? When something is created, something else is probably being destroyed as a result, and so on and so forth. Last thing is going to be that energy is a mostly transfer-based idea, okay? So if energy exists inside of the food that you eat, once you ingest it, it gets broken down and transferred into a different type of energy, right? And then it all gets recycled. That being said, we have to remember our concepts of system and surroundings. And when we talked about systems, one of the things we introduced was this idea of the reaction that is happening is the system. Everything outside of that is the surroundings. So if the system produces heat, that heat escapes to its surroundings. If the system absorbs heat, it's going to absorb that heat from its surroundings. Those are major concepts back in Chapter 5. From there, we want to talk about this idea of spontaneous processes. So these are going to be ones that don't need us to do anything in order to get them to happen. We don't have to add heat. We don't have to stir. We don't have to agitate in any kind of way. We don't have to put any pressure on the system, etc. Okay, That's going to be what we refer to as a spontaneous process. Something that occurs without our input altogether. In this particular um, Example, we have a spontaneous process where we have a flask that has nothing in it and we have a flask that has a gas in it. Once we remove the barrier between the two, the gas moves from one of the sides to the other and that's a spontaneous process. We didn't have to do anything other than remove the barrier between the two. Now, theoretically, it will not spontaneously just go back to its original container, right? Think about this in terms of the air in our room. If we, we somehow removed it all, okay, and then we closed the doors, when we open the doors, what's going to happen? It's all going to come right back in. Are we going to be able to remove it all again without doing something to make that happen? No. Okay. That being said, other types of spontaneous processes Maybe spontaneous in one direction, but not in the other. So remember, we've talked about reversible reactions in the past. Reversible reactions are going to come back into our lives here in a big way, in that if we can do something in one way and it'll happen without our intervention, that's a spontaneous direction. If it needs some kind of input or some kind of Humpty Dumpty put it back together again, that means it is not spontaneous in the reverse direction. Right? You can drop the egg and the egg will break. You cannot put the egg back together. I almost thought that was a double yolk, but it's not. It's two eggs. <laughs> J 
Just like we said, spontaneous processes may occur in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. Spontaneous processes are going to be temperature specific. So they may be spontaneous at a high temperature, but not at a low temperature or vice versa. One of our best examples is going to be the phase change for ice to melt at above zero degrees Celsius. Ice will spontaneously melt. We don't have to do anything. We just put the ice cube in that environment and it will definitely change phase. If we are below that zero degrees Celsius, ice will not spontaneously melt. We're gonna have to do something to make that occur. Whether that means changing the pressure or hitting it with a hammer or whatever it might be, that process would not be spontaneous because it needs help in order to occur. Would that work? No. <laughs> Big try. It'd be funny to watch. You Someone try that. Around. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, ice just, just hit it with a hammer a lot. Yeah. Mm. I think we know exactly what would happen. I don't know if we need to necessarily do that one. <laughs> We could try it. You prove yourself wrong. No. Can I do an ice cube with a hammer? Wouldn't it just like slide away? Depending on the environment, yeah, absolutely. It's like you don't see it. All right. So, have you seen the video of the person that like took the turkey by smacking it? I heard there was there was like a theoretical there was like a theoretical description of how many times you'd have to slap it in order to get it to actually cook because well when you hit something what do you do let's talk about this from a thermodynamics perspective what are you doing when you hit something you're transferring energy in the form of heat or even mechanical energy if you will and in doing so what are you doing to the molecules in the turkey you're speeding them up. If you speed them up enough, what's going to happen? It cooks the turkey. And there have been very interesting calculations out there. I highly encourage you to Google this because it's a Reddit forum altogether. So we can melt ice with a hammer. You could hit it. You could slap it till it. But I don't know why you would do that because that would be a lot of work. We should try that. I'm going to get you a chunk of ice and put it on the bench and see how many times you have to hit it before it melts. And by that I mean, this sounds like a way to occupy your own time in the summer. Like go into your freezer and just start. like an interesting lab. It does sound like an interesting Just do me a favor and make sure you tell your mom you're planning on doing this so she can record it for me. All right, moving on. <laughs> Literally watching ice melt. That is what you were going to do. Or helping ice melt with the... This is ridiculous. How many times? How many times do you have to slap the one pound turkey breast in order to get it to fully cook to its internal temperature of 165 degrees Celsius? No. Uh, you could do it on your own. All right. In a reversible process, like we said, we're going to apply this to what we know about chemical equations, okay? So, in a chemical equation that is reversible, one direction is typically going to be spontaneous, while the reverse direction would not be, okay? So, in a reversible process, we very rarely come across systems that have spontaneous in both directions happening, it's typically a one direction is spontaneous, the other would not be. Does that mean that the reaction is not reversible? Absolutely not, right? Even if our ice melts, could we refreeze it? We could. What would have to happen? Change in temperature, change in pressure, things of that nature. Things can be put back into their original states, for the most part, without much trouble, and by that I mean with a reasonable amount of energy, right? So phase changes can happen with a reasonable amount of energy. Now, when it comes to converting a chemical or a substance from one thing to another, that is not always the case. Sometimes the amount of energy required is what we would consider unreasonable or irrational. Yes, ma'am? So, like, it can be switched back, but not everything can? Correct. Some things are just so unenergetically favorable, and we're going to start using this, this terminology. The term energetically favorable versus not energetically favorable are ones I want you to get comfortable with. 
when we say something is not energetically favorable, what we're saying is the amount of energy required is prohibitive. Does that make sense? So we're saying we'd have to heat it up to a temperature hotter than the sun. Probably not going to be very easy to do in a lab setting. Does that make sense? That would be what we would call unenergetically favorable at that point. Okay? I don't want you to think that there's, a, there's any such thing as a reversible process that cannot be reversed. If it is reversible, there is a way to put it back the way it was before. But it may be prohibitive to do in a lab setting. Doesn't mean it can't happen, just means it's probably not a practical thing to do. And we will see more and more examples of this as we get into our Gibbs free energy idea. Okay? We're getting into the wonderful world of gray area. All right? Next one is going to be what we call an irreversible process. And so you're going to think of this as things that really just cannot go back to what they were. And this is one of those examples that we're going to see is that gas spreading, right? When a gas is in two different containers and we remove the barrier, the gas is going to mix into both sides pretty evenly. Just gas behavior, that's going to be an irreversible thing. We can't really undo that. Most spontaneous processes, if they are truly spontaneous, are going to be irreversible. Most of them are going to be irreversible. And remember, we said irreversible is different than reversible. Irreversible is going to mean we're, we're not putting it back. Think the egg dropping and cracking. That's not going backwards. Okay. That brings us to a way to determine spontaneity, referred to as entropy. Okay. This was a term coined by a man by the name of Clausius. You've seen Clausius' name before. We talked about the clausius Clayburn equation a few chapters back. Not very important, but just kind of understanding this is the person who postulated that entropy was a kind of generic term for how spontaneous something is. We can talk about this as far as the amount of randomness or disorder present in the universe at any point in time, or present in a specific system at any point in time. In order to get there, of course, there were some assumptions that had to be made, one of which has to do with heat. Heat delivered versus temperature at which it is delivered, so Q, You've all seen Q before, lowercase q. We used that when we did calorimetry last semester. So Q equals MC delta T using our food burning lab, if you will. We take that amount of heat that is produced or released and we divide it by the temperature at which it is done. All right, so the temperature at which that thing is being delivered. He thought this is pretty important. And what this led him to believe was this idea oops, of entropy. So this is going to be something that, um, sorry, this is going to be something that measures how random a system actually is. And it has to do with our motion of molecules. So we're going to talk about a few different ways of describing the motion of molecules. What's your most common one of, that we've used before? How do we measure how fast something's moving? Temperature. Right? We talked about kinetic energy. Talked about kinetic energy of our molecules, which is directly related to the temperature at which those molecules are. We've introduced the fact that temperature is related to the states of matter. So lower temperatures tend to be solid. Medium temperatures are kind of our liquids. Higher temperatures tend to be our gas phases. All of that's going to come into play for us to introduce this idea of entropy. And the base thing you need to realize is entropy is all about how random our molecules are, how much they're moving, and whether or not that movement is predictable. Okay? Just like heat and just like enthalpy was, remember enthalpy was H, and total energy of a system, entropy is going to be what we call a state function. What is a state function? Anybody remember? It does not depend on the path that is taken. Nice, Gavin. A state function is something that does not depend 
on the stuff that happens in between, it only happens on the beginning and the end. The beginning state, the end state. We do not care about the path taken. We don't care if this thing rotated 200 times before it stopped moving. We don't care if it spun around, um, took a, you know, kind of bird's path, if you will, from point A to point B. We care about where point A is and where point B is. Now, obviously, if it were a smart bird, it would take the straightest line, but we don't care either way. That means that we can determine the change in entropy of a system to be dependent only on the final and the initial conditions. Okay, so this is important. We're going to take this and we're going to introduce Gibbs free energy, which you all read about. <clears throat> Supposedly. Alleged. All right, and going back and putting this together with what we initially talked about, the amount of heat and the temperature at which this thing is done is going to be able to help us identify what the total change in entropy is for any specific system. This is if a process is occurring at a specific constant temperature, so not if the thing is changing temperature. And this only works if you have a reversible system to deal with. This particular calculation works if you're dealing with a reversible system. We'll talk about what to do in non-reversible systems here soon. So that was the first law of thermodynamics. Basically says the order of the universe is constantly in motion. And that energy is constant. The second law of thermodynamics deals primarily with entropy and says that the overall disorder of the universe, disorder and entropy, remember, those are going to be the same types of ideas. The overall amount of disorder in the universe is constantly increasing for spontaneous processes, but that the entropy of the universe does not change for reversible processes. So if your process is probably is spontaneous, entropy is increasing. If your process is not spontaneous and it's reversible, then it's staying about the same. Okay, so here are the two, these are the two options, right? We have reversible and non-reversible. For a reversible reaction, delta S stays a constant, so it's zero, okay? For the irreversible, spontaneous process, delta S is increasing. What does that mean about the overall entropy of the universe? If we put the sum of those two types of processes together, what do we get? It's going up. The total entropy of the universe is constantly going up. That kind of goes against the ideas of energy is constant. Yes? So does that just mean the, the universe is constantly getting more randomer? Correct. That is absolutely what it means. The universe is constantly getting more and more disordered. What is there to counter disorder? Order. <laughs> Order in the form of heat and energy. Okay? So it's not that everything is just kind of going willy-nilly and everything's getting out of control. Okay? That's not how this is meant to be interpreted. It is, however, something to realize. The overall amount of disorder is constantly increasing on a universal level. Does that mean that's happening in here right now? Maybe. On like small processes in your body. The amount of disorder in your body kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We call it aging, <laughs> right? But that isn't necessarily what we're trying to say. We're not saying that or disorder is going to be causing more and more issues in our universe. It's not like the, the planet's not falling apart, guys. Like, it's not what we're saying here. We're saying that the amount of disorder of processes that are existing in the universe is going to overall be increasing. To temper that, we have heat release, Okay, we have heat absorption. We have processes that happen in stars like fusion to create new molecules from old molecules and things of that nature. So there are processes that kind of counteract what's happening, and this has been happening for a long, long time. 
This is one of those reasons we say the universe is still expanding. Okay? Because it still is. All right. So here is our mathematical way of describing what's happening with our entropy. The entropy of the universe is going to be equal to its system plus the surroundings. For a reversible process, this overall number should be zero. For the entropy of a universe and the irreversible process that we will talk about, spontaneous processes, if you will, the system and the surroundings added together should be greater than zero. Based on this mathematical description, remember that our big conclusion was the entropy of the universe is going up. That's what's on my next slide. Based on this information, the entropy of the universe overall, as a total, is going up. This is the second law of thermodynamics. This is the actual second law of thermodynamics. Your question tomorrow is going to ask you to describe entropy or describe the second law of thermodynamics using entropy as a major topic. When you're talking about this stuff, and this is, a lot, this is a writing, right? This particular chapter is a lot of interpretation. I know we hate those types of things. Con concepts are difficult in chemistry. I get it. When you're talking about this, it is not enough to say the entropy of the universe is increasing. You need to go further into it. And you need to tell me irreversible processes have a change in entropy that is positive and non-irreversible, or I'm sorry, and reversible processes have a change in entropy that is zero. And when you put it together, because there's only reversible and irreversible in this, in this universe, when you put it together, overall entropy increases. Do not get entropy confused with enthalpy or energy. Do not get those things confused. All right, let's go back and let's talk a little further about what entropy is on a molecular level. And we've heard about Boltzmann before too. That name should sound semi-familiar. Talked about Boltzmann distributions when we were talking about uh, give me a second. Mm -hmm. Orbitals. We talked about orbitals. S orbitals, P orbitals, all of that. That's a Boltzmann distribution. <sighs> all right. Boltzmann assumed correctly that temperatures are really good indication of the amount of kinetic energy something has. Do you agree? We talked about this a lot. Talks about why the measure of kinetic energy and temperature are directly related, right? The faster the thing moves, the hotter it is. The slower it moves, the colder it is. Sound right? Sound good? Let's all nod our heads for me, please. Thank you. <laughs> if this is the case, okay, and we said that entropy is this measure of randomness, then what does that mean about a cold sample, something held at zero degrees Celsius? As far as entropy is concerned, at low temperatures, do we have a lot or a little? A little, right? That stuff's not moving very fast. Is that stuff not moving at all? Never. If something stops moving, okay? So, and we're going to talk about the conditions under which molecules in theory would stop. We haven't gotten there yet. If something stops moving, it violates the second law of thermodynamics. We're trying really hard as a society not to do that. We don't really want to do that. But at some point, I'm sure it will happen. For our particular cases here, let's talk a little bit about the types of motion. Is this something we kind of talked a little bit about back when we were talking about uh, molecule shapes? There are three primary types of motion that we're going to deal with here. So molecules move in one of three different types of ways. The first is going to be translational. 
So that's the movement of a molecule from one physical location to a new physical location. That's the first type of movement, most common, right? The one you think about when you hear, oh, the molecules are moving. The next is going to be the vibrational motion of a molecule, and that's a, a molecule in place that's kind of going like this, okay? Vibrating back and forth, kind of going like this. Woo! All right? And our next one is going to be full rotation, right? So think about the molecule and spin it. Could I spin that way? Sure, I'm not going to try. <laughs> I could do a somersault for you, but I wouldn't on a hard floor. But that's what a rotational motion would be. Actual full rotations. Vibrations and rotations can kind of get us mixed up here because could something be going like this? And does this kind of feel like rotation to you? It does. Don't lie. But a full rotation is like 360 degrees. Something is spinning. Think spinning versus just kind of moving in place. If we go outside, nope. We'll nope. I'm not doing a somersault for you. Thank you for asking. I appreciate the curiosity. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Do you remember when I fell down? Yeah, let's not, let's not break my neck too, guys. <laughs> The floor was wet. Yeah, the floor was wet. It was slippery. It happened. It was very slippery. You weren't even. You weren't even here. You missed it. You missed it. Thursday, I fell down in lab. It was funny. No, it was funny. <laughs> no, it was pretty funny. Yes. Yes, Molly called me on my open-toed shoes, and I was going to change them, and I fell down because someone over there, like, called my name, and I turned, and I... It was a good time. It was a good time. No one got hurt, thankfully. Nothing hurt except my pride. It's fine. Uh, it was funny because someone was like, oh, no one saw it. I was like, oh, no. Everyone to, saw that. We chose it's, not to say anything. <laughs> Until the end when Ben asked if I needed life alert. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. All right. That being said, moving past just thinking about types of motion, if we can think about a molecule sample, let's say we're... We're looking at water at 50 degrees Celsius. So what phase should it be in? Liquid. If we could zoom in on those particles and take snapshots of the molecules at any particular instant, okay? So think about Polaroids at any point in time, okay? Then what we could do is we could take a picture of what they're doing. We could look for molecules that are rotating we could look for molecules that are vibrating. We could look for molecules that are translating their motions. This is referred to as a, as a microstate in thermodynamics. A snapshot of what's happening at an instant in time. That is how most chemistry has to be done these days, or it was done then, okay? Now we have these things called electron microscopes that we can hook up a camera to, and we can take a video of molecule motion at a very molecular level. Right? We have a little bit more now as far as technology is concerned, but the same idea is still going to apply. This idea of microstates is what, how we're going to refer to what happens at two different temperatures, or at one temperature for a while. Right? If we keep that sample at 50 degrees Celsius and I take 50 pictures over the course of 20 minutes, I'm going to see different things happening over that entire course of time. It's not like everything's just going to stay in place and not do anything. There's no, there's no such thing as a boring sample at that point, right? Molecules are moving. Molecules are rotating. Molecules are vibrating in place. They're trying to get past each other. We're seeing intermolecular forces that might be broken or formed at that point, and so on and so forth. There's a lot going on, is what we're saying. With those different number of microstates, we can get some more information about entropy, one of these things is the number of microstates we can associate with this. Every single thermodynamic state, if you will, so temperature, will have a certain number of microstates. We can figure out what the amount of entropy is given the constant of Boltzmann 
okay, and the number of microstates. So another way to calculate entropy. Is this one going to be reversible or irreversible specific? No. This one can be whatever we're looking at at one point in time. So this is a single point in time. What happens if we're looking at a process? What happens if we look at the equation, the chemical equation of this is what we started with, this is what we ended with? We're going to take this in two different time points. And doing this at two different time points gives us an initial and a final. And using some fancy math, we can get the change in entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the natural log of whatever number of microstates you had at the end divided by the number of microstates you had at the beginning. So here's our second way to calculate a change in entropy. Don't forget that the delta indicates a change. That means for a process, entropy is going to go up with more microstates. The more you've got, the higher that number is going to be. All right. How do we increase the number of microstates that are, are going to be present? The same way we, we would change the amount of randomness there is in any situation. First thing we can do is we can heat it up. If we heat it up, what happens to our molecules? They move faster, right? If we increase the volume or the space over which they have to move, they've got more, they've got more room to move. More randomness. Last thing is to be the number of molecules. Number of molecules is usually indicated by a what in this class? Moles. Thank you. The number of moles of something present. Okay, so using the three different phases, which phase has the highest amount of entropy then? Your gases, which has the lowest. Solids and what's in the middle? Liquid. Our liquids. What would plasma? Uh, uh, I'm gonna put it here. <laughs> I'm not really sure where it would be. I wouldn't. I'm not sure where it would go according, like, compared to a gas. I don't know where it would go compared to a gas, but I know it would be more than a liquid and more than a solid because a plasma is kind of like a high-powered ionized molecule. My guess would be like here. My guess is that it's going to be higher entropy than a gas, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Please do. I won't remember that one off the top of my head. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. That being said, let's talk about some of the things we've spent a lot of time on this semester, one of which is solutions chemistry. How does entropy get affected by if we dump another solute into a solvent? We add sh if we add that sugar to our water, entropy goes up. We add that salt to our water, entropy goes up. General rule of thumb is if you're mixing things together, entropy is going to increase. It's going to go up. Yes, ma'am? Like higher yeah. than a gas? Yeah. That makes sense. It's an ionized mm -hmm. gas. Ionization just means it's going to move faster and be attracted to other things. So the attraction for their molecules means it's going to be like a magnet. The difference between molecules that are not magnetic and molecules that are is that magnetic things are going to be attracted to other things that are. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Generally, when we put something in a solution, it's going to have higher entropy. Okay. Other general statements about entropy increases. Entropy is going to go up when we create a gas from either a liquid or a solid. Should make sense. When we make a solution from a solid, a.k.a. dissolving a solute in a solvent, our entropy is going to go up. Right? Think about it on the order of the solid side of things. If we take solid salt particles... They have a pretty low entropy, right? They're in that solid phase. If I add them to a liquid, are they solid anymore if they dissolve? 
No, they're more liquid, right? So they're gonna be able to move more, meaning their entropy goes up. Think about it from the perspective of the thing that isn't moving already. It helps a little bit. The number of gas molecules is gonna go up. So if we increase the number of moles, particularly in the gas phase, general increase in moles means more movement as a whole. If we look at a tiny little beaker with a set amount of moles in it, set amount of molecules, and then we take that small sample and we add more to it, overall, everything is moving a little bit more because there's more of them to move. This is like the stuff argument in our atomic sizes. Oh yeah, I'm bringing that back. Mm -hmm. As we move down that periodic table, we just add more stuff to our atoms, they get bigger. If we have a small sample and we just add more stuff to it, it's all gonna move more, right? One particle kind of moving by itself has a set amount of motion. Two particles moving has more motion, double if you will. Yes? So is this kind of like the heat versus temperature argument? Like as in like, you know, a pool has more heat than a kind of like a pot of coffee, just because there's more molecules. Because there's more the molecules, heat. correct. All right. Yeah, and if they're at the same temperature specifically. Of course, yeah. And remember, there's a difference between heat and temperature. Of heat course, is a no, transfer, that's what, that's what saying, right? Yeah. So you're talking more about kinetic energy, totally right? So yeah. the kinetic energy of a coffee pot at one temperature, let's say 100 degrees Celsius, is going to have is going to have less energy than a than maybe a hot tub at that same temperature, because the hot tub has more molecules that are at that same temperature. Yeah. Oh, really? yeah. I don't know. I don't know a hot tub. <laughs> All right. That brings us to the last law of thermodynamics. That's the third one. For any substance, we're going to go with pure solid because at hopefully at zero degrees Celsius, you're in the solid phase. Or at zero Kelvin, if you will, you would be in the solid phase. <laughs> right? Um, if you can... Get a substance down to absolute zero. Remember, absolute zero is zero Kelvin. Mm -hmm. If you can get a substance down that far, there will be no entropy. The third law of thermodynamics states that at zero Kelvin, there will be no entropy. We haven't gotten there. <laughs> We've been trying to get there for a really, really long time. Yes, sir. Can we do the extra credit where we like join the Flat Earth Society or whatever we're going to do? You're not going to join the Flat Earth Society! <laughs> can, we, can we watch the uh, documentary about Absolute Zero? I have it, but what probably not. Thing? You got to watch that sophomore year, didn't you? you Why? No. Because you liked learning about Robert Boyle and how, and how he like... Robert Boyle was so obsessed with winning a race that he like made super dangerous conditions and like killed one of his lab assistants because oh. something imploded like a glass container imploded i didn't have time with you guys because covid hit <laughs> no no no. this was like a documentary we did and it was it was the end of his sophomore year it would have been it would have been in april may that we did it because i only ever do it once at a certain time of the year hmm? we could do that after the final we have stuff to do after the final don't worry we do we're going to talk about green more chemistry. Access, we are going to go back to chapter 18 after the final. And talk about green chemistry. Green chemistry. Green chemistry is a fancy term for like recycle, reuse, reduce. <coughs> what? I think you're stuck with me for thermal reset. What do you mean? What's the point? <laughs> it's that or I make you write a paper. You're going to do what I want or you're going to write a paper. Yeah? Say again? Yeah. Your grades aren't due until the end of the year. To KCC, but your Bishop Mac grades are due at the, la the end of May. <laughs> yes. <laughs> your grade on May 13th, which is the final exam, is the grade you're going to get at KCC. So our grade... Just like last semester, you take a final before. Your final exam, those of you interested, is May 13th. You can write it down. It's a Thursday. It's the last day I can possibly give... It's the last day I can possibly give you a final exam for KCC and get my grades in on time. 
So that is when it will be. And yes, we will review beforehand. We, we review a lot. We have two more, 20 and 21. Wow. Oh, wait. We have two more that real. we have two more we have two more that have to be that have to be uh, completed before the final exam. We didn't do anything every Friday. Yeah, not really. We had a study hall. There were only two days. Kevin, there were two days after the final exam before your final exams. What are you talking about? All right, back to class. All right, all right. Listen, please. Let's get back to it. For our entropy values, we can determine what we call standard entropies. Just like we did with delta H's, we, were able to, we are able to measure what entropy should be at specific temperatures. Most common temperature we're going to measure at is 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. And they are given for specific molecules. Okay, so you, hopefully you can see where this is going. It's something we did with delta H's. With delta H's, we were able to figure out the total delta H of our products, and we were able to subtract the delta H of our reactants to get a total amount of delta H for a reaction. With delta S, we can do the same thing. If we have a reaction that involves H2 and N2 and we form a product, then we can do our products minus our reactants to get our total delta S. Okay. So standard molar entropies. These are going to be things that are going to increase for the most part with an increasing molar mass. So the heavier the thing, the more molecules for the most part, the higher the entropy is going to be. These are going to only really be available for what we call standard states. That means what they're found in at 25 degrees Celsius. So hydrogen is going to be a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. And we'll measure that entropy for hydrogen at that particular state. The larger and more complex your molecule gets, the larger your entropy value gets. So as we move from a smaller molecule, carbon and hydrogen containing molecules, all three, right? As we move from a small one to a larger, more complex one, we see our entropy values go from one number to something much higher. General rule of thumb, as you increase the number of molecules in something and get, make a more complex network, the more entropy is going to be contained within. And that brings us to the same thing you've seen before. You've seen this before. Replace the S's with H's and you've done this process. What do you need to do this? You need constant values. You need table values. What do the N's and the M's mean? You may remember? Coefficients. Right? So if we're talking about a simple reaction, we take the sum of the delta S of the products minus the sum of the delta S of the reactants. And what do we need to do in front? We need to use the coefficients. Please do not get this confused with this. Those are different things. This guy is going to be a standard for a specific reaction, if you will. So in our particular example, we would want the Two times the delta S of H2O for our product.